Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on otitis media in indigenous children. Middle ear infections and the hearing problems which result in indigenous children are a huge issue for these kids' development and education. In some remote communities, the rate of chronic perforation of the drum can be over 60% with a significant unmet need for hearing aids. Overcrowding, passive smoking, poor hygiene, poor nutrition and limited access to evidence-based care perpetuate the problem. Today's programme is about how we can all do better in preventing and caring for this condition in the children who have it. You'll find a number of useful resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Let me introduce our panel to you. Andrew White is a paediatrician based at Townsville Hospital and a senior lecturer at James Cook University School of Medicine. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, Norman. David McIntosh is a near nose and throat surgeon uh, in Maroochydore in Queensland. Welcome, David. Evening. Ray Jones is a general practitioner at Boganaru Aboriginal Medical Service in Grafton, in New South Wales. Welcome, Ray. Good morning. And Joe Davey is an Aboriginal health worker specialising in ear and eye health in the Northern Territory in Darwin. Welcome, Joe. No. Welcome to you all. Joe, what do you see when you get out there? Um, a lot of pussy ears. No, I see a lot of, and mainly with, with young kids as well and babies, a lot of, a lot of pussy ears. And it's depressing when they see kids with pussy ears all the time and nothing getting done about it. Yeah, we've been talking about this for years. Is it just the same as it always was? What's the trend? Yeah, it is always the same. We've just got to keep getting to the parents and educating them. What do you see when they're older, the children are older? Well, with language and learning is difficult. So um, after years of pussy ears kind of thing, it's um, language is really down. So they don't learn a lot. And presumably the volume is high. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people talk loud in the communities because they can't hear. So you've got children with language deficits and when they gr get to adulthood that still exists, that you, they never catch up? Yeah, and their ears are still pussy in the teenagers as well. They don't seem to... And as an Aboriginal health worker, what sort of work are you doing with them? Well, um, apart from doing school screening, we're looking at the kids at the creches and um, trying to teach the mothers how to clean their ears with tissue spears and um, clean their ears and trying to make them a lot drier and, and heal them up. Yeah, and um, when you say screening, are you screening for otitis media? At the school age kids we are, yeah. Andrew, is there evidence for screening here? In fact, that's one of our questions. We had a question from um, uh, Sam, an audiologist in, in Sydney, asking if there was a role for screening programs. Look, it's um, debatable, Norman. I think, um, you know, it sounds good that, you know, we should screen for something that's common and if we can pick it up, we could do something about it. Um, the problem that we see sometimes in practice and you probably would agree, Joe, is that there's endless screening, but nothing done about it. So I guess it's getting the, you know, and what I'd say is probably what we need for ear health is ongoing programs rather than screening. So continuous surveillance and, and ongoing treatment programs. Ray, your experience has been similar to Joe's? Um, yes, the, the, the past years and the poor hearing as a result was my experience in the early part of 2000 and 2003 till we started um, attacking otitis media in our community by improving the nutrition of the people who were suffering from otitis media and we had dramatic improvements in those communities so what did as you a do? result of doing that. So you, you, you felt that your medical treatment wasn't working? Yeah, well, the, the medical treatment had been we, we just did, we did traditional medical treatment, which at the time was oral antibiotics, um, ear toilet, and maybe we, and we used drops as well, but they were potentially ototoxic drops, um, Sofridex, I think we used. We, this was before we had access to Ciproxen ear drops. And, and, uh, and it, it basically, our, our, the traditional treatments, we had the same results we had the same audiometry. The, the Royal Deaf and Blind Society had been doing audiometry on the, on the community of Bayugal for many years, and, the, and, nobody, and the results were the same each year. They were atrocious. 
only 40% of the kids had normal hearing at the school. And it wasn't until we looked at why the, you know, what was happening and what, what, was, the, what was causing the problem and we, we attacked it from a nutritional basis and we improved the nutrition of the kids at that, in that small community. By doing was, what? By adding fruit and veggies to their diet on a daily basis. And within six months, we had detected a remarkable improvement in hearing tests, audiometry, on the children. And rates of skin infections had dropped as well, with boils and impetigo becoming less common. Now, obviously, that wasn't a randomised trial. No. But, David, you've seen the similar benefits from nutrition. Yeah, I mean, what uh, Ray's referring to is, is, is documented in other communities. Um, as, as far back as I can recall, looking into the, even to the 1970s, when people documented the rate of uh, chronic disease from an ear point of view, um, the rates of incidence of this were much higher in those children that had poor nutritional status. Now, would any of our children have ears like this if they lived in similar circumstances? Well, or is there something... The, the reality is that they would, but we're talking about the magnitude and the, and the numbers. We're, we're talking about communities... So there's with... nothing about Aboriginality, it's the social circumstance, it's the circumstances in which a child is growing up that's causing it. Well, I think the disease that we're talking about is we notionally describe it as being, a, you know, it proportions of third world status. And that's consistent with a lot of the other uh, social and... and uh, so what are the risk factors for chronic autism? What is, let's just get it down to the point. What, what is the pathology we're talking about here? Okay. So we're talking about an infectious process. Uh, we're talking about an infectious process uh, where um, there may be acute exacerbations that come and go. Uh, but we're really talking about a community uh, or a situation where it comes and it doesn't go. Uh, and it may manifest, of, manifest itself as recurrent infections with they improve to some degree but never quite get better, fluid remains, or they perforate and discharge, and they continue to discharge. Um, in terms of what perpetuates that... And is that, that discharge, if you, if you culture it, there's an organism in it? Um, it's a little bit complicated uh, when you start looking into the science, but as a general comment to keep things simple, the answer is usually yes. Um, we're dealing with a, a type of pathophysiology which is referred to as biofilms, which is a, a conference in itself. Um, but, it, but it explains why a lot of traditional treatments don't work. Because essentially the surface, li the lining of the orticles or what have you, uh, are, are lined by a biofilm of yeah, organisms. The, the slime, the slime biofilm doesn't is is relatively resistant to standard antibiotics. Um, for various so it's reasons. almost like the ear becomes a foreign object to the body. Um, well, know. it beca just becomes a breeding ground, essentially. And the risk factors, Andrew. Um, risk factors are Aboriginality, but not genetics, as far as we know. Um, it's social conditions, so it's overcrowding, it's contact with lots of other children, lots of other children who've got, if you swab their fingers, they've got the organisms that cause otitis media. Um, breastfeeding's protective, so bottle feeding is a risk factor. Um, exposure to cigarette smoke or to any smoke is a risk factor. Undernutrition, I'm sure, is a risk, risk factor. Um, and recurrent recurrent you know what tends to happen is and the studies in the northern territory show that that all kids get ear infections but the indigenous kids from the remote communities were colonized with the bacteria much much earlier and had repeated infections leading to chronic um, or damage to the ear so the assumption here joe presumably is that 100 percent of the kids have, have have a problem in some communities yeah and, yeah, because so it's the rare what? child who doesn't? Yeah. And has anybody worked out what the threshold is where there's no turning back? Where, you know, the, the, the point where you really must intervene if you want to have a normal developmentary trajectory here, you know, the, tr the kid to do well in life um, without hearing damage which damages their development? Do, is there a point where you say, this is where we've got to get in? Maybe, you know, Menzies proved that at um, three weeks of birth when the problems start. So maybe we need to look at it from the get go, you know, the date straight away from then, and then start looking at it. And what I normally say with the health workers out in the communities is start looking early, and um, we want to try and catch it before it gets any further. So if you've got a little chest cold, then make sure you fix that up because if you don't, that's going to work its way up into the stasis tube and um, get infected. Andrew, developmental trajectory, what's the no turning back? 
time. Uh, I think that's a hard question, but because but, you'd never want to give up with any child. But the exactly. I mean, if you if you intervene at any stage, then the traje the trajectory. Like if you've got a child who's five and they're not hearing well, and you intervene with hearing aids, their learning will develop further. But obviously, that child would have been better if the intervention happened when they were three, and perhaps even better if it happened when they were two or one. David, is it medically preventable? Are the sort of things that doctors and Aboriginal health workers do going to make a difference here when the risk factors and the environment to which they're going to return are the causative factors? Well, well I think that's in the background of, of the problem. Um, and I don't think that's an excuse not to try. But it's actually probably more of an incentive to do so and address the other factors at the same time. And Ray, there's guidelines now from OATSI. Yeah, the, 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 there's Aboriginal guidelines for the treatment of middle ear infections and, um, and, and pussy ears and chronic suppurative otitis media. And has that changed how you practice? Um, the guidelines, um, well, we, 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 we use those um, traditional treatments. Like we, we find the saproxen eardrops have been a marvellous um, adjunct to treating suppurative otitis media. And, um, and I've Amoxil, amoxicillin as a, in a, as a, <coughs> for treatment of acute otitis media is a good regimen for seven to ten days um, in a dose of 50 milligrams per kilo. I think that's the recommended dosage. But um, you need to, well, when you're seeing this happening in families, and if you follow up families, you see patterns of it happening in particular families and usually the most socially disadvantaged families where there's overcrowding and um, basically then there could be poor hygiene and poor eating patterns in the family, then we've included it where I work, uh, where we actually prescribe nutrition, we prescribe fruit and veggies to those families. We'll so come we back to that again later. Let's uh, take some case studies and follow these through and, uh, and pick up some key information about the guidelines and the evidence-based way of treating these children uh, as we go through. So Lucy is our first uh, case. She's two, two months old. She comes to see uh, you, Ray, with her mum um, for her immunizations and well baby check. She's a bit distressed on examination. So you look inside her ears and uh, this is what you see. Yeah, well right. she's got inflammation and um, swelling of the um, tympanic membrane. So she's got acute otitis media and she's got this at the age of two months, which is very young to see acute otitis media. I mean... But Joe, you're saying you see it commonly in babies? Bul yeah, bulging ears, yeah, I do see them often, yeah. So what are you going to do for this baby? Um, I would, I mean, initially I would treat the middle ear infection with probably amoxicillin um, in the appropriate dosage for 10 or 14 days. I'd try to take a, a history from the mother on what are the risk factors in that family and there's lots of risk factors, you know, um, overcrowding, smoking, um, poor nutrition, and uh, for the family, you know, and I'd, I'd like to intervene if there, if there is significant risk factors in that family, then I would put up my hand and say, look, this family needs some support and, and the child obviously needs intensive follow-up, otherwise this child is going to end up with chronic, you know, suppurative otitis media and very bad hearing. In, we, in the next couple of years. We've had a question from a general practitioner in South Australia asking, uh, Andrew, what evidence is there in a baby like this for prolonged antibiotics? I don't know that there is in, there's a lot of evidence in a case like this, but certainly if, if this child was getting recurrent episodes of, of otitis media, um, then there's evidence that prolonged antibiotics that will guideline? reduce. It is in the guideline. Oh, I, it will be if it isn't. <laughs> David, what's your view on long-term antibiotics? Uh, I think uh, we're dealing with a high-risk population and uh, we need to be mindful of, of course of antibiotic use in general but we're not talking about in general, we're talking about a very specific prob uh, problem here so 
anything that you can do to you know, suppress infection. Uh, but you, you've got to do it in conjunction with everything else uh, that uh, both um, Joe and Ray are talking about. Joe, is it easy to convince a mother that this is serious? Um, no, it's not. Because uh, she's got other issues as well, other health problems. So it's just a matter of, you know, trying to expl sit down and explain to her that, you know, the baby's not going to learn anything while they've got ear problems like this. So, you know, it's gonna, it takes a long time into trying to get the message through to it with her because of um, other things happening as well. So, yeah. So, Andrew, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, in the guidelines, is if you look at that ear in another week and the ear is still, it, 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 the child still has acute otitis media, the guidelines say to continue antibiotics or to increase the dose of antibiotics to 90 milligrams per kilogram per day. So, Ray, we've got some slides showing the results of your work. Now, obviously, in a two month old, you're just going to encourage breastfeeding, you're not yeah. going to encourage uh, you know, getting yeah, stuck into. Right. Yeah, no, vegetables. No, that's right. But yeah. show us the just the, show us some of the impressive results you got by feeding your community, the supplementary right. feeding. Well, we initially when we started, when when I used to go to this um, community of Bayugal, when I started visiting in year two thousand, they had surround sound at the school, and the teachers had microphones and they had loudspeakers around the walls, because the kids couldn't hear the teachers. Only. Of the blue graph shows that the blue column shows that at the beginning of our, when we st started our nutrition program, only 40% of the kids had normal hearing, and um, and basically there was about 30% who had moderate hearing loss, and there was about 10% who had moderate to severe hearing loss. So and then there was a level of mild hearing loss. So the hearing loss was. You know, it was you know m more than half the kids were significantly hearing impaired. Um, so we we did um, basic because our traditional treatments were failing. We did some basic pathology on all the kids. We did blood tests on all the kids, and we found that every kid there had low vitamin C levels out of the normal range. They also had about eighty percent had iron deficiency. These are the things that you commonly see in impoverished communities all around the world. I mean, I've heard of it. It's been documented in indigenous communities in Canada and North America many years ago. And by so we, we targeted nutrition. Initially, we tried vitamin supplements, but they were the kids didn't like them. It was ineffective. So then, then we just um, started feeding the kids fruit at school every day. We'd take up a box of fruit once a fortnight when we did our clinics at the school and we'd leave it at the school and the p teachers would feed the children fruit on a daily basis. And within about three to six months, we, we started to notice that the children's hearing was improving and they were getting fewer skin infections. And if we can go back to that slide, after about six months, we got up to 50% of the children having normal hearing. And by the year 2006, we had over 80% of the children having normal hearing at, at that school. And they disbanded the surround sound system. They didn't need it anymore. This was a, a very small community and it was easy to study and it was easy to implement changes. So we could document changes. And then, but as a result of that small study, we then introduced this program into the other communities that we service, of Grafton, McLean and Yamber. And when we changed the program a little bit and that we just targeted families that had problems. And now we do that, we target families that have got health problems, either ear infections or skin infections or boils or whatever, or, well, basically infectious illnesses. And we, and uh, if there's overcrowding in that family and they're from, uh, if there's overcrowding in the household where sometimes you get up to 15 people living in a three bedroom house, then what we'll, we put them. We subsidise their fruit and vegetables to the tune of forty bucks a week. They pay five dollars a week. We pay thirty-five dollars. I'm giving them a box of fruit and veggies. That family, and we make a condition. We make a contract with them. They come in and have a health check twice a year. They get an audiometry done. All the children have health checks, audiometry, and blood tests. And we've been doing that now for seven years, and we've expanded it to. It's been so successful. We've run it. We've got funding to run in Coffs Harbour and down at Barraville now. 
which are both got so significant. Anecdotally, is it having an impact on hearing? And hearing is good in our communities now. Hearing is good in our communities. We, most of the, because we, we do audiometry on all the children on the program, and most of the children have good hearing now. Yeah. So, anecdotally, it's good. We've got a, we've got a fellow studying it at the moment, Dr. Andrew Black, who's doing his PhD um, thesis on this program. So he's studying it more scientifically, rigorously. We started it off just as a trial project and we expanded it because it worked. But I think that, you know, you've got to look away from the box. In the past, we've looked at traditional, just therapeutic treatments with drugs and they've been largely ineffective. And as Joe's saying, in the Northern Territory, they have dreadful problems still. So Andrew, with the diagnosis, we're just saying this is on site. This is, you know, you see a bulging dull red, mm -hmm. uh, you know, red drum, otitis yep. media. You see a retracted drum with fluid behind it, you know, chronic serious otitis media, you know, and a perforation is a perforation. Yep. We don't have to do anything fancy. We don't need to needle the drum or anything yep. like that. Well, that's the diagnosis, a practical diagnosis. David, do you agree? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Very pragmatic. Let's go on to our next case study and, and, and look at some more issues. James is 23 months old and he comes to see you, Ray. He's, got a dis he's had a discharge in his ear for about three months, <coughs> despite the course of antibiotics. And you look inside his ear and this is what you see. He's got a suppuration through his eardrum. He's got pus in his ear canal. He's got an, an infection behind the eardrum. And so he's got a, I would make a diagnosis of chronic suppurative otitis media. He's had for about three months, so he's... Yeah. We really need to clean the ear before. So we've we got to clean the ear. Clean That's Show us how we do it, it uh, Joe. Mm -hmm. All right, then we're going to. Um, we all no normally say tissues or toilet paper because that's what's normally available there. So basically, just get a piece of tissue. Take the. I normally get the corner because you can use use the um, all the others as well, same time. So it's just a matter of. I don't know if they can see it. Just screw it up. Nice and firm and tight. And then um, nice and tight like that. And then you can just stick it in your ear. Let it, leave it in your ear for a little while. So you don't have to wiggle it around, you just put it in. Just put it in there and then it'll just absorb it all up. And then you pull it out and hopefully the rest of the gunk that's on it will come out with it. And you can do it again, and, but you don't want to jiggle around too much in there or too many cleaning because it makes it start making it red. And so you've got to look after each one? I mean, if, it, if it's yep. you doing it or after, the doctor? After you do the first one, pull it out, have a quick look. The more pus there, put it in again. At least you in. know where it yeah. is if it's on the side. Or, and then put it again and pull it out again. So, yeah. so after cleaning, this is what the ear looked like. Ray? Well, there's a, a large perforation present in the eardrum. Um, and and you can see that now and basically you've got to treat that condition and I guess the, the treatment nowadays would be saproxen eardrops um, for a week to ten days and you'd, you'd follow that child, you'd have to follow that child up maybe on a daily basis to get the child to come in and clean the ears and put the drops in, even supervise the putting the drops in because unless you get the pus out of the canal you're not going to heal up the drum. What are your tips for people, Joe, in this situation? First of all, it was two drops twice a day. Well, how, how often do you put it in? Two or three drops, yeah, yeah twice a day. Depends how bad it is. If it's if it's bad, then yeah. And on normally three times a day if it's really bad, morning, lunchtime, and afternoon. But twice a day. And the third, I mean, at night there is more or less when they're as, when they try and do when they're asleep. If it's a baby or a child, clean all their and then put the drops in. That way they're not moving around too much on it. And it's much easier for the mother to come in with the child to have it done, you, then you know it's being done. Yeah, yeah. And what are your tips for uh, you know, actually how you put it in? So the child presumably has to be lying down, just tell us how yeah, you... Yeah, put the head on its side there and then just put, pull the ear out and then put the drops in there. After you've cleaned it, after you've dried it out? Yeah, well this is after we ear wicked it, yeah, yeah. cleaned all the pus out there and then we had a look and all the pus has gone in, then you put it on the side there put the drops in there and then um, different people do different things and uh, David and me will pump it and try and push it down into the drum there, into the stasis tube there. Before 
a couple of seconds just so it'll soak in there. So you've got a little trick for recognising that the pus is out and you've done it effectively? Yeah. What's the trick? Well, pumping it down there into the stasis tube there and, and then ask them if they tasted it and if they tasted it, that means it went through the stasis tube. Right. And normally the, the pus doesn't go back when the antibiotics has been through there. And David, if it's done properly like that, what sort of success rates do you get, at least in the first in the, the sort of yeah, episode? So, so I guess one of the things to do in association with this is you've got to emphasise water precautions. Um, you, you're not going to make much progress if this child is going to jump into, I mean, obviously not a 23-month-old, but in general, the child's going to jump into the local water hole and introduce that water, plus wash out the drops. You're not going to make much progress. So this is an important part of, of it all, is actually just water precautions. And what if they've introduced a swimming pool into the community? Well, well, look, that, I think that has been a revolution in a lot of ways. It's been a, a fabulous substitute for the water hole. Um, and also, uh, as long as it's maintained, heavily chlorinated, uh, apart from the ear side of things, it's been shown to show uh, benefits with skin. Uh, infection rates and so forth. And schooling if they're and, only and, allowed to and, go. And the policy of no pool, no school, um, or no school, no pool, um, has, has made a difference to it, school attendance rates, which is uh, another the benefit of the... And if you've got a perforation and you go, and you go into the pool, what happens? Well, the reality is that in the circumstances we're describing, um, if that water's clean, uh, probably a fair number of these kids are going to be okay. Um, but you'd prefer but, during but, this but it's not, but it's not the best option. How long does it take for the perforation to heal? A small perforation can heal in a few days, but a large chronic perforation will take probably months, I would say. Would you agree? Yeah, uh, yeah, some of them can take quite a while. On drops the whole time? Uh, well, no. no I think that the, the crucial part of the drops really is to, is to clear out the uh, discharge. When you get the ear nice and dry, nice and clean, and the inflammation has settled down, then you've introduced a, a favourable environment for healing. And... Again, you know, looking at all the other aspects, nutrition and passive smoking and all those other factors uh, that need to be emphasised. If with monitoring you're seeing a slow but sure closure of the hole spontaneously, the thing to do is just sit tight and, and hope that it will proceed to, to completion. And in, the, in practice, a lot of them never heal up, though, don't they? And is well, that look, because they haven't got adequate treatment? Or? Well, look, the, you know, not necessarily is the short answer. I mean, some just won't heal up. Um, and it's the, they're the ones that you look at surgical intervention and the like at some stage to finish the job. Um, but the but reality, that brings its own issues. That introduces a whole another aspect to the, the conversation with respect to management, of course. Um, and there's usually a gap in between you know, when they get to having that decision and everything else that's been done beforehand. And they're going to take their patch back into the community to the circumstances which caused it in the first place. It, 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 a lot of this comes back to what's going on in the community. Uh, and Ray, how do you deal with hearing testing and, and following this? We, we have audio, we have a audiometry service attached to our AMS, and we take it out to the communities, and we go into the schools and do primary school children, basically, and, and screen them for just screen them for their hearing, and um, and we intervene if they, you know if they've got problems. Um, so what, uh, in this situation, we're not talking about oral antibiotics, we're just talking about the topical treatment. Yeah, I think with, with uh, a chronic discharge over three months, no systemic features otherwise, uh, really the evidence is for topical drops, uh, ear toilet, water precautions, um, and the expectation over time of spontaneous closure. The other thing I think we should do is talk to the parent about the child's speech development. Um, and if, particularly if there's concerns about speech development, then that makes checking the hearing and intervening more important. Absolutely. Um, the child probably can't hear very well just based on the picture. Mm. So, that's true. Yes. So, so there's the things people, that parents can do, with speech, the child care can do to help that child develop despite having poorer hearing. Joe, how assertive should the Aboriginal health worker be with the family in this situation? Well, they definitely should... Um, talk to the parents and constantly talking to them and saying because there's talking just and, as you know seeing, Joe there's talking and talking yeah I know we're talking but looking at the child and seeing the child is lying there and not really do, saying a lot or making noise so obviously there's some sort of problem there so maybe they got to get the point across to the parents to say that this baby's not doing anything you need to do something about their ears 
A question here from Jill, an audiologist in Queensland, is asking, I'd like to know if there are any new initiatives for Aboriginal health workers to help us overcome shame issues when amplification is required, particularly in the classroom. And this, this child's a little bit young for that, but um, are there shame issues when amplification is required? Well, there's still the same shameness there where, like the hearing aids, now they, they're doing in the caps. They've got the caps on with the hearing aid, they, them balaclava things. They put it on there with the hearing aids. And they're trying to you, wait, look at different ideas and different ways of trying to get away from that um, shame that's having hearing, hearing aids in there because it's just embarrassing for them. And that's not going to go away. So. When do you refer to an ear, nose and throat specialist? Um, when I, had, I can't fix their problem up, either through the parents or through the, or the, through the um, clinic. So, yeah, but we'll go through the clinic to do all that stuff through the ENTs. A question here, David, from Paul, audiologist in Melbourne, asking, given that um, general practitioners are short on the ground, there's problems problem with primary health care, um, what's the role for extended practice amongst audiologists and direct referral from audiologists? Well, the honest answer is I've taken this up politically and unfortunately it is all political. People will be quite familiar. An optometrist can refer to an ophthalmologist. An audiologist can't refer to an ENT. There's the, the middle step is the GP in between. Um, I really think we need to empower our audiologists and give them the privilege uh, of using their skills uh, and being able to access ENT because uh, quite often that intermediary step uh, really is a, a delay for what is ultimately the outcome anyway. Let's say we've got a few more photographs of, um, of eardrums. Let's just go through them just to remind ourselves what various ones can look like. David, what's this? What Certainly. So, so this is one of the dreaded complications of grommet insertion, which is very topical if you're looking at uh, surgical intervention with children coming from remote communities. Um, this, this is a grommet, the blue uh, structure in place, and it's, it's discharging. So this is not a, an ideal situation. Uh, again, it needs to be managed much the same way as we were managing the, the discharge associated with a chronic perforation. So topical drops, ear toilet, water precautions, um, and this child, if they don't settle, may ultimately require further surgical intervention to remove the grommet. Hope that the hole heals up, hope the infection settles down, but then you could be back to square one again. So it's, it's a problem fraught with So what, uh, what is the role of meringotomy and grommet insertion? We've got to be mindful of the community. Um, well, I mean, in the non-Aboriginal community, it's controversial enough. The absolutely. suggestion is that if you actually take children and you give you know, randomised, large randomised trials suggesting that the outcome in the end is no different. Well, well that, that is true. Unless in, they're at risk. That, that, that's, that's the crucial bit, is, is, is the, the, the study that that comment's based on looks at about 600 children. What's neglected is that about 5,400 children were excluded from that study because they were at risk. So you're dealing with a group of kids that weren't that bad to start mm. with, and not surprisingly, there wasn't that much difference whether you did something or not because they, where they yeah. were starting from. The other thing that's been found, though, following up in that cohort, is that the rate of chronic uh, ear disease down the track is much higher in the observation group compared to the treatment group. So your cholesteatomas and your ossicular chain erosion and so forth is much more prevalent in the group that was observed compared to the group that was treated, even though speech outcomes and those sorts of measurements came out much the same. So you've got to take that with a bit of a grain of salt, but we're not talking about that in the context of Indigenous, of course. And how common is cholesteatoma in this group? It's an interesting discussion because it's probably somewhat protective in the fact that they have a hole. A cholesteatoma is a variable disease for various pathologies. Remind us what it is. Well, cholesteatoma uh, is, in all essence, skin that's got into the middle ear, one way or the other. Now, that can be congenital in a very small number of cases. In the majority, it's acquired. In the majority of, it, of acquired, it's because the eardrum itself has become retracted, formed a pocket, keratin is built up and you end up with a uh, build-up of keratin infection disease progress. And very occasionally it can be because there's a perforation and the skin grows through the perforation into the middle ear itself. So in the mainstay with our Indigenous uh, children uh, who have perforations, it's, it's, pr it's protective against the retraction disease. The problem is that everything else is a problem that goes with it. So fortuitously, cholesteatoma doesn't seem to be more prevalent in these circumstances. Um, but having said that, it's still an awful disease regardless of whether you're indigenous or not. And your treatment? 
uh, for cholesteatoma is surgery uh, in, in the mainstay. Uh, in the mainstay, it is surgical excision, uh, reconstruction of the defect, um, and maintenance and, and monitoring thereafter for years and years to come. So very, you know, not a complicated story. Let's go to some of our other images here. This one, David? Yep, so this is a slightly more favourable picture at the moment. So we've got a child with a perforation. Uh, there is some scarring of the eardrum, which in the mainstay is neither here nor there. So if this child was to attend to the clinic, uh, a dry ear, not discharging, um, this child doesn't need antibiotics. This child doesn't need anything cleaned up. Um, this is the sort of child that we would want to have the hearing assessed. We'd want to establish uh, their hearing level to gauge whether they're a candidate for audiological rehabilitation whilst we're waiting time for the hole to close or then to make a, a decision at an appropriate time based on the child's age and a lot of other factors as to when we may entertain surgical closure but not letting them go deaf in the meantime. And the next uh, one? What age will you do that? Uh, age is variable. Um, you can do it from five onwards, but really um, probably from about age eight onwards is probably a, a better option, um, just to make certain that um, you don't end up in a situation where you've patched a hole and then the middle ear disease starts up again. Joe, sure, let's have a look at this last one. It's yours. Not your ear, but your... Yeah, not one. my ear. Yeah, um, yeah no, this, I like this one because it, it shows you... I don't. I've had, I've had something to eat. Uh, <laughs> it shows you everything in there. And there's just one of many things that we see in there. And it's a fly just sitting just on the out, out of the canal there. And there's another bug away at the back there. But behind that other bug, if you clean all the pus and all that away, there's a, there should be a hole there. So it just the fly just flew in there and got caught up amongst all that, all that um, pus in there and everything. So there's a hole down the back there. So how'd you get the fly out? Oh, you can, you've got tool, I've got tools to pull it out. Or if you haven't, you can um, syringe it out. Mm. And then um, once you syringe it out, but I've got the tools to pull it all out, then dry mopping, and then you see the um, tissue spearing and see the hole in the back there and everything. So, yeah. Ghastly. That's a nice, lovely photo. Okay. David, do you want to make a comment? Uh, look, I, I, I think that just reinforces really what we're talking about. I mean, we're living in a first world country, and that's a picture from this country of a child in this country. It's absolutely shameful. Let's go to our next case study. Uh, this is Sarah, who's seven years old. Um, she's had multiple courses of antibiotics. She's not going to school very much at all. Her speech and language is uh, below average, and she's been referred to you, David, uh, following concerns from the general practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, the picture we're painting here is of a child that's not hearing too well at school. Um, the concerns are what the cause of that hearing uh, loss or otherwise may be. Uh, and uh, as part of audiological assessment, it's shown a bilateral conductive hearing loss. Uh, tympanometry is undertaken, which shows uh, flat uh, type B uh, tympanograms on both sides. And in the clinical picture of the suspicion of uh, otitis media with effusion, um, the, the, the uh, clinical picture really is a child that's deaf uh, with a re readily reversible cause. Um, and then it comes down again to appropriate management depending on various circumstances. The most crucial part is you've got to get this child hearing one way or the other. So she's got a, s a significant issue. What are you going well, to do we've for got her? An, we've, got, we've got an issue here for many reasons. I mean, we're, we're laying the foundations of this girl's future life in many regards. Uh, she's got the social as aspects of it, she's got the communication aspects of it, and she's got the education as well. From a, a practical point of view of this picture, there's really three options. You can do nothing and wait for her to outgrow it. That's not appropriate because she's already behind. So from a management point of view, really, you're either looking at hearing aids, waiting for the fluid to then go away by itself, on the proviso that you don't have anything else that intervenes, such as recurrent or further infections, or uh, damage to the drum and the concerns about cholesteatoma. Uh, and then the third option is, uh, from a surgical point of view, is adenoidectomy and then removing the fluid. And then the question of removing the fluid comes down to whether you put a grommeter in or not. And that, again, raises a lot of issues regarding to where these children are going back to. Um, you, you really got to balance all of the risks and benefits of, of that uh, in conjunction. Uh, the other thing um, that was referred to uh, previously too is the sound field uh, systems in schools. Um, they work fabulously, not only for the children that are deaf, but also for the children that aren't deaf uh, because of the acoustics of classrooms and the dead zones are there. Um, the study is quite, quite convincing that it's a fabulous investment to make. 
Um, not only for that child, but the other ones, <coughs> other ones in the room too. And what about insufflation or you know, the nose blowing, bubbling yeah. you know, through a straw into the bottom? Yeah, That's absolutely. I, I think it, it's something that makes us feel good because we're, we're doing something, but unfortunately the evidence isn't there. Um, it's, it's anecdotal. Uh, any studies are pretty uh, low powered. Uh, not very well designed. Odovins. Yeah, yeah. The same with the same odovins. Things. Yeah, there's, there's no evidence. If you look at it from a practical point of view, if you think about an otovent, which is a little balloon that you put over the nose, you're blowing against pressure. So all you, what the theory is, you're putting pressure then through the eustachian tube. That will clear the fluid from the middle ear, but it's only going one way, and that's into the mastoid. It's not going down, back down the eustachian tube. Um, and if you come back and look at uh, these kids, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes down the track, the fluid's back again. So it's not shifting things. ENT went through the whole uh, pneumatisation and, and you know, puff, puffing air through the eustachian tube and so forth. It, it, unfortunately, it doesn't work. It makes us feel good that we're doing something, uh, which is not to be um, you know, discredited, but um, the studies really aren't very good one way or the other. Some show a benefit, some actually show a detriment. So really you're back stuck in the middle again. What about developmental interventions, Andrew? Um, I mean, I guess the biggest thing is, you know, if I saw this child, I might be sending her along to see an ENT specialist, but I'd also be sending her along to see Australian Hearing to ask them about hearing aids for her. Um, the classroom thing I think is really important, but it's not, you know, it's not an in intervention for an individual. It's something that if I was working in a community, I'd suss out whether the classrooms ha had sound field systems, whether they were acoustically okay. And if they have got sound field systems, are the teachers actually turning them on and using them? Um, and I think they're fabulous because, you know, they'll help that girl, but they'll also help the other kids in the classroom who we don't know have got hearing Do you find problems. they're not being turned on, Joel? Some people aren't using them even though they've got them. That, yeah, yeah, some of them don't turn it on or, or the battery's gone flat. Or yeah, things like that, uh, or it's all plugged up with pus coming out again and blocks it all up. So uh, they don't get checked regular, but they should, yeah. So, I mean, we're talking here about a condition which just people see so much of that they almost don't care. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of teachers may not get well orientated or taught about how to teach no. children who have hearing impairment. Yeah. What about specific interventions apart from that with individual children, difficult though that might be in a remote community? Well, if she had speech impairment, I would send her to see a speech therapist. So that could help with her speech development. But I mean, they're, obviously they're, they're not hanging off the trees in uh, well, <laughs> Catherine or Tennant Creek, are well, they? Well, you uh, might get sure. her to see someone in Catherine or... Mm. Yeah. But, you know, and even in remote, I would still, I would still refer to speech therapy because if mm. they get a million referrals, you know, it may help someone to decide to appoint an extra speech therapist. The, the other um, issue, if we never refer to them, they'll never... Yeah. Mm. The, the other issue, of course, is that we're talking about children where English may not necessarily be their Absolutely. first language, mm. uh, although that's their language of education. So um, that, that can exacerbate the situation in some regards as well. Mm. I guess there's other things that teachers can do too. You know, they can sit that child at the front, mm. they can give the instructions verbally and visually, um, they can you know, they can use prompts for change of activities or change of topics. Um, there's, a, there's things they can do. So, Joe, do they ever, when a child like this is 15, do they ever, you know, get through it and out the other side? Well, I know, looking at the teenagers' ones now, and aren't some of them still got posse ears, perforations, and um, what do you do then if they're at that age? Mm -hmm. We were talking about laying the foundations. Um, one of the scary statistics that I've seen uh, in, in years gone by is looking at uh, Indigenous uh, people that are through the, the criminal justice system, um, and particularly the ones that end up in jail. Um, it's estimated that as, as high as 20% of those people have some form of hearing loss. Yes, in fact, there's a question yeah. from uh, WA along those lines, yes. So, I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, you, again, you're dealing with a situation where you know, twenty percent of, of indigenous people potentially in front of a judge that can't hear what's going on. Um, they've had poor education, so they have poor comprehension of what's going on. Their English may not be their first language, and all those events combined are, are really a very difficult situation. When you then look at the long-term uh, rehabilitation of this person, um, whereas if you got in early on in the piece, you would hope um, that the, the outcomes would have been a lot more favourable. So. To summarise, we're dealing here, not just with this case, but overall, we're dealing with getting in early, um, 
if you've got a child who is, has got otitis media, the first episode, you want to treat it fairly aggressively, you get it clear. If there is a discharge and perforation, you really ideally want direct observation of treatment. You don't want to leave it to the parents at home, make sure it's dry and the child gets a decent course of Cipro drops in a clear ear. And then, but You've really... we resources to do that. Yes. But then you're really dealing with a situation where um, we're dealing with all the problems of Aboriginal communities, which is reducing overcrowding, trying to get smoking mm -hmm. rates down from 80% to 20% uh, or less. And, um, and nutrition, as you say, mm -hmm. even though there's not a randomized trial, what harm can we do in behind the box of fruit and vegetables out? Um, and, um, but then pursuing it and not letting this well, go. Right. Well, yeah. Over in Western Australia, they put in the swimming pools. You know, like some of these therapies don't make a lot of sense, but they work, you know. So I think you've got to look at what works, what's working, and. And be pragmatic because yeah. you're saving a generation. You know, what Henry and David have been talking about, and with this Sarah one, that could be the same kind of problem as well, with um, probably need to try and put a grommet in to bring the drum out because it's retracted. You've got hearing aids, you might need your hearing aids to put the hearing aids on this, but their hearing with that um, audiology not long ago, it probably in the 50, this is probably the 50 and 60 mark, the level of the hearing loss. So hearing aids would probably be good for that if you don't want to do, do the grommets. You know, so they, they, their lack of um, education and we see a lot of those retracted and they're having a lot of problems with these things because hearing and speech and all that stuff. So it's exactly what Sarah's got there but in a different way. Yep. And all the same problems what Andrew and Dad was talking about. And it's you? ubiquitous. It's yeah, every and then you put the teachers one. up, put them up the front for learning and the sound field and all this stuff. A lot of kids up the front, Joe. <laughs> so they can hear better. Yeah. Because yeah, when they're at the back, a lot of them sit at the back and they'll be naughty and they can't hear anything. So they play up. So when they're up the front, they, they, and they can't play up, and then they can see or hear, hear what's going on. So how, how many Aboriginal health workers are in the Northern Territory who specialise in ear, nose and throat like you do? So, there's some new ones coming on now with, with um, some of the AGI money or the Territory funding come out of that. So we've probably got another five, five more coming up there, five out there now, so yeah. And they're starting to get, start get some more. And in other states, you're aware of what happens in other states? Yeah, no, I don't know what's happening in other states. Don't well, there's Great very, resource very for few, all like Joe. There's very few people trained like Joe uh, in New South Wales that I'm aware of. Yeah. Aboriginal health workers. I don't, we don't have any... We don't have Joe in our community anyway. In the, when we serve as... We just have to call you, Joe. We <laughs> <laughs> need to get Joe bottled. <laughs> What are your messages for people watching, Joe? Um, I would like like the parents to clean more of the baby's ears and um, I suppose get the um, the baby or the kids to start learning early in age. And throw the bloody cigarettes away. Yeah, and, um, and try and pick up the language and the learning and all that stuff. And Ray, before you give your message, there are resources available now. There's what, Ear InfoNet, there's a new guideline coming out, there's a CARPA manual, there's a fair bit going coming out, coming out that's available for GPs, Aboriginal health workers and others. Yeah. Here's the, uh, I think it's the Ear InfoNet there is the, on the screen. Yeah, yeah no, there, there's a lot of resources around and um, it's a huge problem in the Indigenous community. And, and my message would be Try to improve the nutrition of your communities that you service. If you're dealing with indigenous communities, then that um, the nutrition is a huge part of this disease process because the, the people are, you're dealing with are immunocompromised and they get infectious diseases as a result. And if you can help promote their immune system work better, then they get less infections. David? Um, we're dealing with the foundations of, of children and, and their future development, which flows on from the individual to the family to the community. Um, we need to treasure what has been around for so many thousands of years that is being lost at a rapid rate. And this is part of the problem, and we need to be addressing it as part of the solution. Andrew? Um, I guess my message for health workers would be 
of oral health staff would be whenever you see a young indigenous child look in their ears, ask the parents about their speech development, if there's concerns, if you see an ear disease, treat it aggressively and treat it early. And the highest priority would be the youngest kids because that's where you might have, an, have a big impact. It's very hard to treat older kids. Thank you all very much indeed. A major issue which requires much more attention from uh, the whole community, not just uh, the clinicians. And I hope you've got a lot of tonight's programme on Ontitis Media and Indigenous Children. Our thanks go to the Department of Health and Ageing for making this programme possible, but thanks also to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. As always, if you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. That's at rhef.com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms and to register for CPD points. I'm Norman Swan, and I'll see you next time.